Hi, my name is Tony Shepard, and I teach here in the music department at Williams. Well, not exactly here. Um, I'm at home in Palmer, Vermont, but you know what I meant. And I thought I would talk about the ways in which my research and teaching are sometimes quite closely connected. In fact, I'll talk about one case where the feedback loop between teaching and research was very tight. In order to do that, let me give you a little bit of a backstory. Uh, Two years ago, 2018, I taught a course on the history of the Broadway musical for the first time in the music department at Williams. And when I taught that course, I eventually got up the courage, as you may have read in the um, Williams magazine, to ask Stephen Sondheim to speak via Skype to my class. And he did, and it was quite fantastic. Um, he spoke the entire time with the students, ask, uh, answering a lot of their questions. And about a year ago, when I was realizing I would offer the course again this year, this spring semester, I also realized that this would be the semester of Sondheim's 90th birthday and 70th Williams reunion year. And I thought that we should try to mark that occasion in some way. So I organized a uh, a series of events, including an alumni concert, which is now up on YouTube that you can watch, and also a scholarly symposium. And eventually that will result in a book of essays about Sondheim's um, works, in, appearing probably in about a year from now. And as I was working on this uh, project back in the fall, I was also working on some other research projects. And what I wasn't working on was my own paper for this symposium. And as the fall semester kept moving ahead, I was getting more and more anxious. What was I going to speak about? And finally, around Thanksgiving time, I said, I just have to stop with all my other research and really dive into work on this Sondheim paper. But I wasn't exactly sure what my topic should be. I knew that I couldn't speak on my research about Sondheim specific overtures because that material had just appeared in uh, my most recent book. So that wouldn't work out very well. And I knew that I didn't really have time to go do um, archival research. So what was I going to do? And finally, I told myself the same thing that I tell my students uh, when they are starting on their own uh, papers for my courses. And that is pick a topic that you are actually deeply interested in that will motivate you to dig deep uh, in detail with that topic um, so that you can write actually an interesting and worthwhile paper. And so that's what I told myself. And I thought that I had always been interested in Sondheim's dual uh, career as both a composer and a lyricist, how he assumed both functions in his musicals. And perhaps this is because I double majored in English and music myself back in college at a certain other liberal arts college we won't mention right now. And so I thought about this and I thought, well, what do I find most fascinating about Sondheim? And I thought that it was his extreme wit, his intricate rhymes, and how closely, how tightly music and words seem to work together and some of my favorite uh, numbers that he had created over the decades. And so I had a topic and I decided that um, it was time to uh, dive, dive in uh, to it by the end of the fall um, semester. So what did I actually find? That's a good question. I found that Sondheim uses music in his shows to highlight rhymes in a variety of ways that he also is able to use music to blend off rhymes, words that don't quite rhyme together. Somehow in a musical setting, he makes them sound more similar. He also uses music to create a sense of, um, we hear in our heads, a rhyming word that's actually not there, sort of a phantom rhyme. Cases where uh, the poet, poetic the lyrics set up that there will be a rhyming word, but instead of getting it, we get a musical rhyme that puts that word into our head. Um, I can give you an example of this. Uh, so life and wife are extremely uh, common rhyming words in Broadway musical uh, lyrics throughout uh, the decades. And Sondheim rhymes those two words quite a bit himself in his own songs. But in two particular works, Sunday in the Park with George and Company, there are specific instances where we get life, 
but the expected rhyming word wife does not appear. And they are significant spots, dramatically, symbolically, in terms of what they're telling us about um, those two uh, main characters in those two musicals. And the reason that we uh, really feel the phantom rhyme is that Sondheim makes the music rhyme, even though the words, that the second word that comes doesn't complete the rhyme. What do I mean by musical rhyming? I mean that um, it's very typical for Sondheim to um, highlight rhymes by having the music, the same melodic gesture appear with each rhyming word, or sometimes in the simplest of cases, having the exact same pitch um, be heard in the voice when for the rhyming words. And there are other ways that music can rhyme without being exactly the same. Uh, but it's basically the musical gesture um, is similar enough that it functions like a verbal or po poetic rhyming. So um, I also found that Sondheim has spoken and written a lot about rhyming in lyrics throughout his career, at least from the 1970s onward. And there's a couple things he's emphasized. One is he claims that for lyrics to be successful, you have to use perfect rhymes or true rhymes. He's also uh, repeatedly said that if a lyricist uses uh, excessive rhyming, or intricate, complicated rhyming, the danger is that R, the audience's attention, will be turned to the lyricist rather than to the character or the dramatic situation. And I've thought about that a lot. Um, he gives an example of the song uh, Getting Married Today, where a reluctant bride, he says, is so hysterical at the beginning of the song that she can't actually rhyme. She doesn't rhyme, and that symbolizes that she is so frazzled. But then he says, as the song goes on, um, in order to avoid boredom with the song for us, but also in order to suggest another form of her hysteria, he then has her sing in um, excessive rhyming, um, in uh, really sort of obsessive rhyming. And I've thought about that, and I wonder whether audience members, when we are encountering a patter song with lots of elaborate rhyming going on, do we actually credit that to the uh, composer lyricist, or do we cre credit that wit to the character, or actually are we crediting and experiencing this as the wit of the performer um, who is actually physically on stage uh, in that moment? Another thing that rhyme does in, and music um, in support of rhyme achieves in Sondheim's songs is that it helps certain rhymes go down um, more easily for us, um, or it um, really punches home the punchline or the um, joke uh, word, the surprising word that may come at the end of, say, triple uh, triple rhyme, three lines that rhyme together. And an example of this uh, from Company, uh, which is turning uh, 50, by the way, this uh, month in April 2020, uh, in Company, there's a song that the married couples sing um, entitled Little Things. The little things that you do together is what makes marriage so special. And um, to give you a couple examples of those very witty biting lyrics. They sing, it's the concerts that you enjoy together, the neighbors you annoy together, the children that you destroy together. Or another example, the people that you hate together, bait together, date together. And what happens is, musically, um, we hear a sequence, the same melodic uh, phrase that simply um, move, the sequence is taking the same melodic phrase and either moving it up or down in pitch in succession. And by using the musical sequence, each time that surprising word comes, the final word comes, it uh, flows just so easily into our minds, into our ears, which makes the song that much more uh, funny and nasty and naughty um, by making it all go down so easily, even though the lyrics are quite uh, scandalous or were meant to be felt as scandalous. What I want to do now is focus on one specific example that um, is one of the best examples of showing just how intricate Sondheim's rhyming can be and um, how much poetic sound he packs into um, his lyrics. And so let's take a look at slide number one. 
these are the lyrics of Getting Married Today. And they are super packed with rhyming. There are end and internal rhymes, alliteration, assonance, consonants, repeated words, etc. What I've done in this, in this slide that you're looking at is I've attempted to use colors, font, and underlining to indicate the intricate connections of the verbal sounds. In performance, this excerpt goes by in a mere 12 seconds. And the excerpt consists of 50 syllables, 44 words, and one surprising cultural allusion to Uncle Tom's Cabin, in case you missed it. We hear uh, nine I sounds, only one of which is the actual word I. So he's drawing a lot from his poetic rhyming dictionary here. Some of the rhyming is quite um, um, clever, very clever in this example. Now, how does the musical setting respond to all these poetic sounds? Check out slide number two. Here, the letters refer to pitches, and I have used colors and capitalization to highlight corresponding points, spots where pitch and rhyme line up. The downbeats consistently emphasize the strong rhymes, go, go, no, door, four, ice, rice, haps, laps, apps, etc. I use the number two here to indicate quarter notes, and all the other syllables that we hear are running eighth notes, half the value. Now note how those long values, those quarter notes, fall consistently on the major rhymes. Almost all the rhymes and the assonance in the first half of this stanza receive the pitch G, and in the second half fall melodically on A. Of course, Sondheim's typical tight motivic melodic style accounts in part for this great synchronicity between rhyming and pitch. I should also mention that this particular intricate musical poetic 16 bars is heard as part of a double song with Paul the groom singing to an entirely separate melody. Let's take a listen to this 12 seconds. Today is for a go, can't you go? Look, you know I adore you all, but why? Watch me die like Eliza on the ice, but perhaps I'll collapse in the apse right before you all. So take back the cake, burn the shoes, and boil the rice. Later this month, I will be teaching um, a class, recording a lecture downstairs in my house on Sondheim's musicals for my Broadway musical class, and. Um, what I'll do is we will dive deep into um, his uh, rhyming and the way music is working with that rhyming, and I'll certainly you know grab the juicy bits from the talk that I gave at the Sondheim uh, Symposium back in March. I will also refer to Sondheim's influence on later generations of Broadway musical creators, how uh, Larson in Rent or Miranda in Hamilton show um, the influence of Sondheim and the way that they use music and poetic rhyming so tightly together. In class, we're going to focus on what Sondheim calls the craft of songwriting. And to do, the only way to do that is to pay attention to the details, the individual notes, chords, and rhythms, and the individual rhymes that he creates in his lyrics. And at this point, I'm going to stop and uh, pause in my thinking about my Broadway musical class because I need to do the reading and the assigned listening for my tutorial class. So I'm ready to ask some interesting questions, I hope, and uh, to dive into discussion with my students in the tutorial on Wednesday. So thank you very much for listening and stay well.